Hello there, my name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Last evening, after having a meal in one of the pubs in Torrington in North Devon with Sandy and Keith Armishaw of River Reeds and Angling Heritage, as we made our way out through the bar area, by chance we bumped into Charles Innes, who for over 40 years ran one of Devon's most famous fishing inns, the Half Moon at Sheepwash, which offered its guests some of the best salmon and sea trout fishing in the county, along the River Torridge. Never one to pass up an opportunity, particularly one involving so much angling history, and from one of the key players in the area for so many years, I arranged to meet Charles at his home in the village the following morning, which is where we are now. So tell us a little about the Half Moon and fishing inns. My family bought the Half Moon Inn, which was a fishing inn on the Torridge in 1958, and we, the family, owned the Half Moon for 42 years before moving on mainly due to health in the year 2000 and during that time the inn became quite famous as a hostelry and for excellent fishing on the river Torridge and we built it up to owning or leasing up to 10 miles of fishing on the river Torridge and we were able to put out up to 15, 16, 18 rods a day on the river. Am I right in thinking that the Torridge has endured a bit of a chequered history over recent times due to various incidents and uses, including commercial cropping and operational rule changes? So now might be a good time to give us a potted history of the river. Yes, certainly. I'll do my best to you on that score. The Torridge as a salmon fishery has been in decline, or was in decline, for a number of years. Now, all salmon rivers in England and Wales have been in decline. There aren't the numbers of salmon about there used to be for a large number of reasons. But I think it would be fair to say that the Torridge suffered a bigger decline than any other river. And the reasons for that are many and varied. But if you go back before that time, if you go back almost a 100 years to the early 20th century, the Torridge was renowned as probably the most well-known and most famous salmon river in England and Wales. And it was fished in the uh, 1940s and the 1950s by royalty. Uh, It was certainly very famous. And for a relatively small river, it's not 50 miles long, and it's not a particularly big river. At its peak, the salmon runs were quite extraordinary. The um, joint estuary, because the estuary is a joint estuary with the River Tor, in its heyday, the nets would regularly catch in excess of 5,000 salmon, and the rods on each river would regularly catch in excess of 1,000. So the actual catch for the small river was probably somewhere between three and 4,000 fish a year, and there was still plenty to spawn. So for a small river, it was probably very near to achieving its optimum level of production. This all changed in the 1960s, reasons of many and varied, one of the main reasons being the outbreak of the salmon disease, also dermal neurosis, which spread to the Torridge in 1968. And that disease, which decimated every river, really, in in Europe and Scotland, Ireland and England and Wales, decimated the stocks in all the rivers, was a cold water disease. So it affected the early running fish in February, March, April and May. And the torrid salmon run was predominantly a spring running river. So the torrid stock was affected more than many other rivers, whereas the torrid stock was decimated by the salmon disease. There wasn't a summer run or a very small summer run to compensate. In one year in 19... I think it was 1969, the rod catch on the Torridge was 269 salmon, and of those, all but 20 of them were caught in March, April and May. I think the reason for the salmon run being predominantly in the spring was historically that the Torridge has a very low summer base flow. So in most years the salmon aren't able to migrate upstream during the summer month. 
in all the other rivers in the West Country, the average base flow, the summer flow, is on average one-eighth of the annual base flow. But on the Torridge, it's only one-sixteenth. So you appreciate from that the very low flows of the Torridge in the summer months. So if salmon disease was one of the main reasons for the uh, collapse of the salmon stock, there were many others as well. Excessive marine exploitation, which of course affected every river in England and Wales and Scotland and Ireland. Uh, But particularly on our river, we did suffer from industrial and agricultural pollution. Now, most rivers suffer from industrial pollution. I won't go into too much detail about that. But the agricultural pollution was something that was a particular problem to this river as it was to the Tamar, which is a a river that rises very near where our river rises. And both rivers run through farmland for the whole of their journey to the estuary. And with the changes in agricultural practice, the need for the governments after the World War, Second World War, wanted to increase food production, farmers were given grants and subsidies to drain the land, so all available land was drained out to increase the land available for production. This enhanced the low flows in the summer because the land was no longer a sponge. And, of course, increased production. There was a change from hay to silage. Silage liquor was a tremendous pollutant. And, of course, with the uh, modern farming methods, whereas a dairy unit would have 10, 15, 20 cows, now, in this day and age, we've gone to dairy units of over 300 cows. And so the increase in the number of animals in the catchment area meant that uh, within the space of about 15, 20 years, from the early 1950s to the mid-1970s, the number of uh, animals actually on the land increased by about tenfold, and of course with the resultant effects of tremendous amount of agriculture pollution getting into the river. Was there any additional threat from, say, abstraction and poaching? I don't think, if I could just refer to poaching... In the olden days, of course, it was a traditional form of poaching where the old locals went out on wild November nights with a pitchfork and a torch and took out a couple of salmon. And that, quite honestly, there were so many salmon in the river in those days, it didn't really affect the salmon stock. Then, of course, as that died out, in its place, you got the more sinister form of river poaching, which was the netting of famous salmon pools. And, of course, in that regard, there was a traditional form of net making was always in Bridport in Dorset. And the poachers were known as the Bridport Gang uh, because most of them came from that area. And with the West Country Rivers being fairly near, it was easier for them to head west rather than head up into Wales or North England or Scotland. So the West Country Rivers were targets. And, of course, we got the famous case on the Torridge when, in 1963... Two poachers tried to net the pool below the weir at Beam at Torrington, at the lower end of the river. One of them had come from Bridport. One was a local man from Biddeford, and they got into difficulties with their dinghy, with the river rising and in spate, uh, with the net result that one of them, the, the lad from Bridport, drowned. So it really sort of brought to the attention of everybody the effect of the Bridport nets. In more recent times, I don't think there's been a serious problem with poaching on the river, simply because there haven't been enough fish to warrant it. Uh, I'm not saying there isn't any poaching, but it's fairly limited. Poaching in the estuary is always going to be a problem, with salmon being taken illegally, not by the licensed netsmen. All I can say about that is we've always had very efficient fishery officers, bailiffs, call them what you will, who keep a pretty close eye on it. And uh, in this day and age, I do not think it's a a major problem. I believe that in many areas now, the Environment Agency are looking to buy out licences and retire them in an effort to conserve fish stocks. Well, the netting in the estuary, uh, traditionally, uh, if you go back 150 years, there there was no control over the nets at all. They could have as many nets as they wanted. Then bylaws came in restricting them to 36 nets. And this, again, is a joint estuary, remember, there are two rivers. 
So you've got a joint S3, 36 nets, which is a hell of a lot net. So they can only operate a sane net. And they can't sort of put a drift net right across the S3, so they are limited in that respect. Then as the years went by, they were restricted, first of all, by limiting the number of times they could fish. There, were, there was a slap at the weekends, two or three days when they couldn't net. Then, by bylaw, the nets were reduced. When we had the collapse in the stocks in the 1970s, the nets were reduced, first of all, from 36 to 18. But the trouble with that is, of course, if you reduce the nets by half, you're not going to reduce the cats by half, because all it means the ones that are left can fish the best stations, and they're catching all, and really it's the best ones that are left, the best netsmen are left, fishing the best stations, So it's not really going to make a lot of difference. And then in 1989, when the National Rivers Authority took over the management of the rivers from Southwest Water, and at that time they were rather flush with money, the NRA bought out the nets for six years, from 1989 to 1995. And that did make a big difference. There was no doubt about that. Stops in the river did improve with a period of six years with no netting. Then the nets came back. They made a complete codge of it. They tried to reduce the amount of netting. By that time, there were 14 nets. They tried to reduce it, and math said you were going too far, you couldn't do it, and there was a hiatus for two years, and the nets had a free-for-all. And then 14 nets were allowed to net for two months a year, because you may remember in 1998, the national bylaw came in to conserve salmon stocks, and no netting in England and Wales was allowed before June the 1st. So that put an end to their spring netting, but they, on our river they were allowed to net in June and July. But then, in 2001, the riparian owners and fishing interests on both rivers, the Tor and the Torridge, brought out 11 of the 14 nets. And this really was an historic agreement because most buyouts of the nets, rather like the NRA earlier, had been for a set period of time, for five years, six years, or ten years. Now, although the agreement with the, these 11 nets was for ten years, there was also a proviso in the agreement that they wouldn't be allowed to net again until stocks had recovered to a level to allow a sustainable rod and net fishery. And the chances of that ever happening in the foreseeable future, were pretty low, quite honestly. So they were basically accepting the fact that they weren't going to net again. And the three nets that were left, the agreement was that when they packed up, when they either gave up through ill health or decided it wasn't worth it or they died, the licence would not be reissued. Now, that happened in 2002. The obviously has just been renewed now, ten years later, And at the moment, all those three licenses are still operating, but there is a net limitation order of one. So when two of them give up and there's only one left, that's where it finishes. And if that one gives up, that can be reissued. The Environment Agency really want to keep one license going in the estuary purely for heritage reasons. And when I tell you now that over the last ten years since the buyout, the average catch of those three nets, presuming it is a legal catch, you're not sort of, they're not hiding a lot of fish away, the average catch is about 50 salmon a year. And when you think it was prior to the buyout by the NRA in 1989, it was in excess of 2,000 a year, we have sort of come a long way. So netting in the estuary now, to all intents and purposes, has come to an end. Is there any truth in one scrap of information I picked up on just this morning, that in exchange for buying out the nets, the rod and line fishery had to become fly only? Well, that was really in the public inquiry in 1981. This was a time when the river really was in a pretty dreadful state and, and the salmon stock, the rod catches had gone down to about 50 a year. So when you start talking 30 years earlier, it was approaching 1,000 a year, it suddenly reduced to 50... There was a major panic, and there was a public inquiry in 1981. That was when the reduced the nets were reduced from 36 to 18. And part of that um, measure of proposals was to have a fly-only rule for the fishermen from September the 1st. 
Any live baiting, worming, prawn, all that had been banned for the rods in 1956. That was also when, when the, the nets were restrictions, the further restrictions were put on the nets in that time. There had been no live baiting for salmon since 1956, and in 1981 the proposal was, as well as reducing the number of nets, to have fly only in September. When the inspector made his report, completely out of the blue, without any discussion at all, he said, to allow for further conservation measures, I think the fly only rule should be May the 1st. And it came as a complete bombshell. It hadn't even been discussed. But we had to accept it. (laughs) So we went fly only from May the 1st. And over the years, as further discussions took place, that was reduced back now to April the 1st. So in theory, we are allowed to spin in March, because the season opens in March. I don't think on our river anybody ever spins now. You can pretty well say it is a fly-only river. And that makes a hell of a difference to the number of fish that are caught by the rods. You can rest assured on that. I would have thought that making a spare river fly only would put in place certain practical difficulties that anglers might struggle to deal with. It's an amazing decision to make when you think that nearly every other river apart from the Tor and Tor, anything goes. You go down to Cornwall and do anything. And it does seem strange to me that you've got a situation where by bylaw, every salmon has to be returned before June the 16th for the rods, and that's on every river in England and Wales. And once they get to June the 16th, they can use any method they like to wheedle them out. Which does seem daft to me. As far as conservation is concerned, it's a fantastic measure having it fly only. It does make a hell of a difference to the rod catch. Where you've got lower down the river, on the middle and lower stretches of the river, where there's good flow, it's quite acceptable, really, to have a fly-only rule. But when you get to the middle and upper reaches of a river, where the river becomes much more closed in, it becomes much more sort of deep holding pools without a lot of flow, there, well, really, spinning is the only way, and if it was allowed, worming and pouring, is the only way to catch these fish. So it's had a tremendous effect, and the fishermen on the middle and upper stretches of the river that used to enjoy fishing, the locals used to enjoy going out, catching salmon with a spinner, and in the olden days, worming and prawning, they've had to give up altogether. And I have to say, I don't really agree with it. It's marvellous for conservation. I'm a lover. I love my fly fishing. I would never dream of spinning. I don't enjoy it. But having said that, I do feel sorry for the fishermen on the middle and upper stretches of the river who, if they're going to fish at all, have got to do it illegally. And that does happen, I'm afraid. Not a lot of it, but it does happen. People say, sod it, I'm going out with a spinner, I'm going to get a fish. Tell us about the River Torridge Fishery Association now and the part that you play in that. The Fishery Association was launched in 19... Get my dates right. 1979. It was initially set up as a little small group in about 1970, just at the time of the outbreak of the salmon disease, and the stock on all the rivers in Devon and Cornwall were collapsing. And the then Devon River Board, I'm not sure it was the Devon River Board or the Devon River Authority, wanted a measure of restocking, and they asked all the rivers to sort of form a little group together so that they could help with the funding of it. And that's what it was. that was the original idea. But in 1979, Lord Clinton, who uh, became the first president and who owned large stretches of the Lower River, thought there ought to be a River Torridge Fishery Association. We had a f- first meeting and we set up, we created with a chairman, a secretary treasurer and a committee, 32 members. And I was appointed the secretary and treasurer and... 33 years later, I'm still holding that position. We now have a very influential body. We've grown to over 120 members. And our object is really just to defend the interests of the river. And, and also, when there are discussions about changes in the bylaws or conservation measures or ways to improve the habitat, we are working with now the Environment Agency. We work in partnership. The big word in this day and age is partnership. As you know, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, but the organisation is more than a talking shop. I understand that you also rear your own fish for stocking into the river. 
over the years, we've tried to work again with the NRA and more recently the agency in habitat improvement. We've worked on spawning gravel improvement, obviously uh, encouraging farmers to fence off their riverbank to minimise agricultural pollution. But our main work has been setting up a hatchery. Initially, the Environment Agency had their own hatchery for the rivers in Devon and Cornwall at Ensley on the Tamar. One, it wasn't a very good site, and two, because of financial constraints. I don't know, ten years ago they decided to close it down, and we had a very progressive fishery officer, we still have, Paul Carter, who saw the opportunity to uh, possibly set up our own little hatchery for our own river. So we were able to acquire a lot of the equipment that was at Ensley for next to nothing. We tried a couple of sites which wasn't very successful, and then we found the almost perfect site for a hatchery on, a, on the Ockmont, where there's a, an old mill with a mill leak and a very cooperative farmer. And we've been there now for six or seven years, and we've got a very enthusiastic group, five or six of us, where we're able to trap our brood stock in the weir at Munkham, where the, where the water's siphoned off for the mill, which is still a working mill. And the fish bath was installed in the weir in 1977, I think. So there's a fish bath there where we can trap our brood stock. We've got the holding tanks. We've got, we then strip our fish and bring on the eggs to the swim-up fry stage. We don't go beyond that. So we are now, as we talk in the process of gathering our brood stock. This year so far we've got five hens. We've got two cocks and we need another two or three cocks. We normally have about five hens and we normally from those five hens try and get between 25 and 30,000 fertilised eggs and they will then uh, be reared on by us to the swim-up fire stage and they'll be released back into the headwaters in probably early April. The idea being that the fishery officer will investigate areas that are devoid of salmon spawning areas. In other words, they're not being utilised. And he'll also go to areas where he thinks the farmers have done their business and the river isn't being, the little streams aren't being polluted. So we're trying to uh, recolonate areas that at present aren't being used by salmon. So yes, over the last four or five years, it has been very successful. Because we put them back as swim-up fry, it's all voluntary work. If we kept them beyond that, it'd be, you'd need a full-time hatchery manager to actually feed them and bring them on. But because we put them back as swim-up fry, we can't add, clip them in any way, clip their adipose fins. So we don't know when we catch adult salmon in a few years hence whether there are salmon or whether they're natural wild salmon. So we'll never know whether the actual fact is making any difference to the salmon stock. We can only hope it does. All I can say is that in the olden days, we never used to catch a salmon on this river under five pounds in weight. The summer grilts were always five, six, seven pounds in weight. In the last two or three years, we have been catching grilts as small as two and a half pounds. We've been catching grilts two and a half, three and a half, four and a half pounds. And I can't help thinking that might be some of our hatchery fish. I was fishing a the lower end of the river two years ago, below Beam Weir, and there was a shoal of fish at the tail of a pool that I presume was sea trout, and when I caught one, it was a little gilt of about three pounds, and it was obviously in the pool, there was quite a large shoal of them, and I just got that sneaky feeling that might be some of our stockfish coming back. Another advantage, presumably, of planting out swim-up fry at certain locations is that they should imprint these locations before leaving and hopefully return to the same spot. The theory is, of course, yes, those fish will come back to that area. They're all Ockmont fish. Now, the Ockmont is the main tributary of the Torridge and it comes off Dartmoor, so it hasn't got the farmland pollution that the main river has. It's got other problems to it, which is basically acidity from coming off the moors. But in recent years, since the fish pass was installed at Munco Campton Weir in 1977, the Ockmont really has become the saviour of the Torridge. And whereas the Torridge, uh, the juvenile surveys are still pretty poor, on the Ockmont, 
the juvenile surveys show that the Ottmond has as good a density of salmon as any river in the southwest of England. So we're taking f fish from the Ottmond, fertilising the eggs, bringing them on, and then putting those Ottmond fish into the main river, the headwaters of the Torridge, headwaters of the Walden, headwaters of the Loo. Now, we hope that they will come back to those places where they were put out. They might, of course, go back to the Ottmond, I don't know. <laughs> And it's also good for maintaining genetic integrity. Yes, yeah, because now one of the platforms of the Environment Agency is now if you're going to restock, you must use your own fish. If you go back to uh, the spring run on this river, when it really became famous, started in about 1920. And there are those who argued that that spring run was created by salmon over, which was brought down from the River Thurzo about 20 years earlier. And similarly, when the salmon disease broke out in 1968, the then Devon River Board could see nothing wrong with bringing down Scottish over anywhere where they could get it the cheapest and putting it into our rivers. That thinking now, that might have been a, if you like, it, was, it might have been a short-term fix, but it wasn't a long-term solution. And it's now generally accepted. If you're going to have a hatchery and bring on your own fish, it must be from your own genetic stock. And also, of course, they do insist that all the eggs are fertilised by at least two cocks, and if possible, three cocks, to get this genetic diversification. What fish other than salmon has the river got in it? Got a good run of sea trout. Traditionally, it's probably more famous for its sea trout than its salmon. So we all talk about salmon all the time, but it has a good run of sea trout. Uh, traditionally, it was probably just about the best sea trout river in the West Country. I'm not sure it is now. It's again, sea trout have suffered from the various problems that I've already talked about, just as much as the salmon. We still get good runs of sea trout. In recent years, there has been a, definitely an increase in the number of large sea trout caught, and I personally think that is because there's been a ban on spinning. Uh, these big sea trout were pulled out by the spinning in dirty water. Now, although I'm very much against these poor people up at the top end of the river not being allowed to spin and not having an opportunity to fish, it certainly made a difference to sea trout, the big sea trout stock. It was very rare to catch sea trout over five pounds. Anything over eight was quite exceptional. A double figure fish was never heard of. Uh, in recent years, £10 fish are one or two a cord every year, and this year we've hit the heights, because in this actual particular season, there's been three sea trout caught over £13. For sea trout, that is big fish, and that is sort of starting to compare with some of the Welsh rivers. So let's hope it continues. On the downside, we certainly are not getting the runs of small sea trout that we used to get. They are very variable, I know. And in recent years, we haven't had the conditions right, but we certainly aren't getting the number of small sea trout, what we call peel, in the river. So we've got brown trout, a lot of small brown trout. They don't go to any size. When the family are in the half moon, I'm the first to admit as fishery manager, we stopped our home beats, the four miles on the home beats, with stock fish, fish of about just under a pound, purely as a put and take. So guests could go on the river and catch some trout. The idea being, if they caught the stockfish, they put the wild ones back. I'm not sure, in hindsight, it was a good move. I personally never did it all again. I wouldn't agree with introducing stockfish into a river. I think you've got to keep your natural wild stock. But there is a good stock of wild trout. Beyond that, there's no pike in the river, God forbid. The only coarse fish of note are dace. I gather the tall as roach. But we have dace. And apart from gudgeon and minnows, that's about it. Now, I know that your work with the Fishing Association is not your only involvement with fishing. I was looking at your book, Torridge Reflections, early this morning, and I believe you also have quite a repertoire of amusing little anecdotes accumulated over the years. Yes, uh, but do you want me to sort of... <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Just a, a few years ago, I was thinking to myself, well... We the family owned the Half Moon for 40 years. It became renowned as a fishing inn. 
Uh, it was one of many fishing inns that existed all over the country. On the, on the Torridge alone, there were six. Most of the little small village inns had a bit of fishing as well, and it was a nice supplement to their income. So as well as being the village pub, it sort of doubled up as a fishing inn, and visitors could go there and enjoy fishing at a very reasonable cost. And as most of them over the years have sort of dropped out, the Half Moon has kept going, and now it's probably one of the very few fishing inns left in the West Country, probably in England. So the Half Moon has, has been quite famous. And I just thought to myself, having the family having been there for 40 years, and I managed the fishery for virtually all that time, and my not as being secretary of the Tory Fishery Association for over 30 years, really I would have put my knowledge and expertise and put together all the amusing anecdotes from the years of the Half Moon, write it down so that, you know, it won't be lost forever. And that's what I did. And fortunately, I found Sandy in Torrington who, who was keen to publish my efforts. And as a result, we've come up with Torrid Reflections, which I think is going to be a very, well, it's an enjoyable book to read, but above everything else, it will be just a reminder of, of the history of the Torridge and the days when these small fishing inns existed. Many amusing stories come up in the book, and you've asked me to relate one. I remember David Hume, he always brought a party down in June every year, mainly for trout fishing with a possibility of the sea trout fishing. And this particular year, there were eight or ten of them, and it was a incredibly hot summer's day. It might well have been 1976, that famous summer. And David said to me, oh, Charles, he said, I've got a, somebody who's never fished before. Could you dumb down and give him a lesson? I said, yeah, let's get organised in my jobs at the pub and I'll come down, David. So about 11 o'clock in the morning, I arrived on the river and um, one of the party was Mary Skinner, who was married to Anthony. And Mary was, I think she was a model in London. She was an incredibly attractive young lady. Anyway, she was stretched out in the grass with a topless bikini on. Uh, incredibly beautiful, and there was I sort of trying to give a lesson with this young lady making no attempt to conceal herself. And with that, the local farmer's teenage son drove into the field with his tractor, presumably to uh, check his stock. And as he drove around the field, he obviously spotted Mary, and I think his eyes nearly popped out of his head. <laughs> anyway... Mary made no attempt to conceal herself. Well, I'm quite serious. When I when I left about an hour later, the farmer's son was still driving around the field. <laughs> and every circuit, you would get a little bit nearer to Mary. <laughs> How long he stayed there, I don't know, but it was really was very amusing. I often think about it. Yeah. The other, another sort of, I can tell you one of these stories, and the other interesting one was the... Uh, a lot of my guests had to park by the river, obviously, when they were fishing. One of our guests went down to the river to fish, and his wife was disabled. So instead of parking by the gate, the entrance of the field, uh, he parked on a little brow of a hill, the entrance of the farm, a big wide entrance with plenty of room, so his wife could look out over the river, over the fields to the river. Which seemed a perfectly sensible thing to do. And when he came back at lunchtime, he was accosted by the local farmer. Yeah, he said, when I go to market, I have to pay to park the car. My poor guest said, well, that's all right, sir. If you'd like me to give you something, I'm quite happy to give you something. How much would you like? So the farmer said, yeah, he said, I think you ought to give me a pound. Well, this, I think we're going back about 30 years. So the chap said, hold on a minute. He said, that's rather a lot. He said, when I go to town shopping, I never have to pay more than 20p to park the car. But our farming friend wasn't going to be outdone. He said, you, he said, you give me a pound and we'll call it a season ticket. <laughs> he duly handed over the pound. <laughs> Another little story, just to finish it off, is, is again in Torrid Reflection. Brian Milner, Dr. Brian Milner, came and fished quite regularly for two or three years and he was quite a youngish man. He was rather sad because he'd recently lost his wife who died. And then all of a sudden he rang me up and he said, Charles, he said, when I come down next week, I want a double bed, please. I'm bringing my new wife. So anyway, he came down with his new wife. And I must the first night, yes, the first night, he said, this isn't in the book, because she didn't want it put in the book. But the first night, 
in those days, there was no soundproofing at all between the, the bar and the, and the rooms above, and they were in the double-bedded room immediately upstairs of the bar. So the uh, following morning, Brian said to me, Charlie, he said, we can't stay there. He said, we'll have to move. I said, I'm awfully sorry, Brian. I said, I hope he, I'm obviously, uh, the, the noise that the people who were late night drinking in the bar kept you away. No, he said, that wasn't a problem. I said, what was the problem then? Well, he said, our concern was that the noise we were making would disturb your guests below. <laughs> but anyway, they went fishing. He took Judith down to, to show her how to fish, and having sort of explained the art of fishing, left her on her own, and she was immediately surrounded by a herd of heifers, terrible town he'd never been in the country before, absolutely terrified, and she sought refuge on, a, on the end of a concrete croy. And about two hours later... Brian came back and rescued her. She was still a nervous wreck. And she walked into the bar. While Brian went up to get changed, she stood at the bar, down two or three gin and tonics in no time at all. And with that, Alfie Harris, who was one of the uh, retired regular farmers who came in for his uh, lunchtime drink, one of our sheep washes answer to the last of the summer wine. And uh, Alfie saw this very pretty lady sat at the bar. I don't know, he said. I haven't met you before. You're a very pretty young lady. What's your name? And Judith said, How nice to meet you. Uh, my name's Judith. What's yours? Well, thank you, said Alf. I'll have a pint. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely, isn't it? Sounds like he rehearsed that one a few times. <laughs> <clears throat> and just to tidy things up now, by bringing a few of the looser ends together as we close... Do you think that the work done by the Association, the Environment Agency, and pressure on farmers and the rest, is actually bringing about a noticeable improvement? Yeah, I wouldn't have any hesitation. It's not just, you know, the ability to go down and catch fish and say, oh yes, we're catching more salmon than we used to, and we're catching more trout, and we're catching more sea trout. The river's in a better state of health. For most of the time, the water quality is very good. But you still got this problem, uh, and you always will have, that when you get heavy rain, you'll get a short period of nutrients being washed into the river, slurry being washed into the river. Uh, so you get a short period when a lot of damage can be done. And I don't know how you're ever going to overcome that. But having said that, there's a tremendous amount of work being done. And now, hopefully, with the uh, new Water Framework Directive, Hopefully in years to come the improvements will go on and we're certainly, considering the financial constraints at the moment, there's a tremendous amount of money being spent on rivers like the Torridge to do their best to improve it. But you've still got your problems and your agricultural problems are still there. You know, we've got, when I go back 50 years, there were probably a dozen, 15 small farmers, mostly with about 10 or 12 cows, and then bring them in, milk them, put them out again. Now there's none left at all. There's one intensive unit with 300 plus dairy cows. They never go outside. They're inside all the time. All their waste has to be put on the land. Probably too much for what the land can take. They do the best they can. But if you get very heavy rainfall... Some of it gets washed into the water court and into the main river. I'm afraid it's always going to be a problem. But having said all that, we're definitely moving in the right direction. No doubt about that. So you're optimistic then? Very, yeah. It's never going to be like it was 50, 60 years ago. But I still think that in the years ahead, people are going to be able to enjoy the river. And I hope they enjoy its history as I have here. Many thanks then to Charles for relating it to us here particularly as I only sprung the idea on him last evening at the bar, then had to quickly cobble together a list of questions on a topic I knew very little about. And in that regard, I think we can both be pleased with ourselves and the final result. 